Sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties. I think we got it now. This is now by Samuel Langbuden. That's me. My art boss, Trisha, spent all the month of February in Milan, where she was putting together her first museum retrospective, and came back with a fever and a hacking cough. On February 25th, I bought her groceries. We stayed as far apart as we could. She kept her mouth covered, and I tried not to touch anything in the apartment. I washed my hands when I left. On March 7th, I went upstate to Bard College for an admissions interview for the MFA program. Two days later, on March 9th, I got an acceptance call. The day in between, March 8th, though I didn't know it at the time, my parents had dinner with their friends, whom we'll call here the Garfinkels. Trisha quarantined herself for two weeks. And after that, I helped her move from her old studio to a new studio. Her friends and roommates who traveled with her while in the self quarantine at around the same time. We had dinner at an Italian restaurant called Joseph's up in Ridgewood, after which we spent some time on the balcony outside her new studio. This was the last time I had a sit down meal in a restaurant. On around the 12th of March, I was on the phone with my parents. My mother kept coughing. What's that cough, I said. She told me that it was a wet cough, not a dry one. And there was absolutely nothing to worry about. On March 15th, Everyone who'd been at the MFA interviews received a notification from the program that an employee of the college had been diagnosed with COVID-19. On the 16th of March, I walked to Harry Houdini's gravesite to sit there and call my community board, my assembly person, assembly person, my New York State representative, uh, my US congressional representative, and my senator, and Cuomo as well, to let them all know that in my opinion, farmers markets where I work are essential businesses and should remain open during the crisis. And also that rent should be frozen state and maybe nationwide for the duration. While I was sitting there, a guy in a National Grid sweatshirt approached and began poking around. He looked very agitated about something. I waved to him in greeting. He told me that this was his great grandfather's plot and he didn't understand why people keep leaving things. At first I thought that this must be Houdini's great grandson but then I remembered that Houdini and his wife had had no children, so this must be a great grand nephew. I told him, I'm just sitting here calling my representatives to get them to put in a rent freeze and to keep the farmer's markets open. He seemed confused. I showed him my container of Clorox wipes and my gloves, and I told him I'd disinfect the bench before I left. He seemed not to care at all. He continued to poke around, muttering to himself, and then he left. The following day, March 17th, my housemates and I had a meeting to talk about what we were going to do during the crisis. We shared a pizza, and afterwards, four of us passed the joint around. The following day, on March 18th, the Garfinkels, whom my parents had had dinner with on March 18th, tested positive for COVID-19. That day, I walked to Manhattan, 13 and a half miles there and back. 
I dropped off film at the lab I use a lot of the time, Secret Digital Solutions, for the last time before they closed, things I'd taken the week before. Two guys on the Bowery fighting over a cigarette. I remember thinking at the time, aren't they worried about getting each other sick? Two guys in Ridgewood fixing a car. I remember thinking the same thing. My friend Freya and her baby and her mother at least 10 feet away. March 19th, I got a text from my housemate, one of the ones I shared a joint with, saying that two days before the joint, they'd spent the day with someone who that day had tested positive for COVID-19. And to be safe, we should all assume that we were now carrying the virus. I told my fish boss and my cheese boss that I wouldn't be coming into work at the farmer's market for the next couple of weeks out of concern for others' safety. But the prospect of two weeks inside with my housemates was unsettling to say the least. I'm fortunate to have become very good over the past 34 years at crossing the street to avoid walking next to people. Between the 17th and the 2nd of April, I walked an average of 12 miles a day taking pictures. And I worked on transcribing a stack of letters that my aunt wrote to my mother in the 60s and 70s when they were in and then just out of college. On March 20th, Cuomo finally issued a stay-at-home order. I walked in the morning and then again in the evening. The market on the corner of Summerfield and Myrtle was pretty empty, so I went in. Even though I didn't need anything, when I saw how bare the shelves were, I started grabbing stuff and left with three bags full. It had gotten dark. No sooner had I put it all away and sat down in my room than some schmuck drove past, blasting the announcement from the beginning of the purge on a PA. It took me a minute to realize what it was, and it scared the hell out of me. I have never worried about walking around New York at night before. I've hardly gone out at night since. That week, I dreamed that I was still cat-sitting for Lucia, as I'd done for all of February. In the dream, her apartment had two floors. Trying to work out logistics of cooking and showering safely, I accidentally had two showers running at once. I went upstairs and downstairs trying to find where I'd left the towel. I saw on a wall panel a smart monitor which tracked water usage in the apartment. Both showers were lit up. It's just like Lucia to have something like this, I thought. All the bathrooms had many layers of plastic curtains hung up to pre prevent the spread of viral droplets. On March 25th, I walked up to LaGuardia and back. On the return leg, I happened to pass Elmhurst Hospital Center. Before I got there, I started to notice more people on the street than I'd become used to. Then I started seeing a lot of pharmacies and medical supply stores, and then ambulances parked on the street or idling. Then I was across the street from the hospital. It was the first time I'd seen an intake tent outside of pictures. There was a bad, quiet feeling in the air. When I got home, I read the headline in the Times, 13 deaths in a day, an apocalyptic coronavirus surge at an NYC hospital.
on many of the walks, I took pictures for a series I've been working on since 2015 of places in New York City that will be permanently flooded by the Atlantic Ocean within the next 50 to 2,000 years, depending on how things pan out. The pictures deliberately exclude any living human figures. And there were places in the city that I'd never been able to work on it before that were now very easy and available. I thought while I walked about how I was photographing two crises at once and the interactions between the two of them. On March 27th, my parents' test results came back. My mother's was positive, my father's negative. On March 31st, we had another house meeting. This one ended in yelling and slammed doors, not by me. Immediately after, like 20 minutes after, I got an email from my friend Monroe saying that his girlfriend had needed someone to look after her cat in her apartment near Fort Greene Park. That weekend, I carried all the things I'd need to Fort Greene. It took two and a half round trips, a total of 17 and a half miles on foot. While cat sitting, I dreamt that I was listening to Mark Marin while transcribing letters from my aunt. Mark took a call from a listener who talked about how hard it was for him to be stuck in lockdown with his father. I realized quickly that it was Jason Portnoy who was in my year in high school. His father, Dr. Russell Portnoy, MD, was a pain specialist who is an early proponent of OxyContin, often quoted in the Times. That's in real life, not in the dream. In the dream, Jason was saying that a court date had been set, I think, for his father's sentencing. It was a relief to know that he was troubled by his father's role in the opioid crisis. He said he had expected to spend a few days with his father, but it might wind up being closer to a year. The call ended, and Mark revealed the guests for the episode, Dr. Russell Portnoy. Dr. P talked about how he had given up medicine to become a headstone engraver. He professed remorse, but came off as an insincere and unsympathetic creep. And I dreamt that Lucia and I and one other person were astronauts en route to the moon, awaiting launch day and facing all kinds of snags in launch planning including an angry woman with a dog who didn't like the spot we'd put Lucia's car while unloading our personal effects, which it was true, was in the middle of a pedestrian path. But it was only for a minute and we were going to move it and she could certainly walk around it, but she would rather get upset and pitched a fit and said that she was so wrought up that she'd have to call herself a cab because she couldn't imagine walking the rest of her short way home. Other elements of the dream I remember. In the command module, there was a giant stack of cartons of cigarettes in the center of the console. The brand was Hadfields. NASA asked us to bring formal wear for pre-launch portraits, and I woke in a panic, realizing that I didn't have and wouldn't be able to get any because, because tuxedo rental places aren't essential.
On April 20th, I turned 34. It was a Monday. I was at Union Square selling fish. My boss shook my hand when I told him it was my birthday. We both grimaced. It was the first time I touched another person's hand in more than two months. Three days later on the 23rd, my friend Pan, an emergency room doctor who had a free rental car from Hertz who was giving free rentals to healthcare workers, gave me a ride from my old place to the cat sit with a few more items. On the 1st of May, reopening started across the country. I think it's a bad idea. We'll see surges all around the 50 states within the next three weeks. On May 3rd, I took acid. I discovered that there, things are so surreal already that, at least for me, psychedelics add nothing of value. Many things feel temporary. Some things have started to feel normal. It's certainly too early to completely process what's happened since late February. Is it too early to start? I don't know. In assembling this presentation, I saw clearly how different my life now is from my now of two months ago. This was a first look back at that just past now, a sub now of the still unfolding present.